So now we're going to simplify the some product decoder for the binary erasure channel. And we see that we can up with a very, very simple decoding output. So on the binary erasure channel, we can simplify the message passing decoder. And the main reason or the full derivation is done in the tutorial. There is an example in the tutorial. And um, we essentially build on the fact that we only have three possible messages. So the messages that we have are essentially 0 or 1 or an erasure. And also the log likelihood ratios, they can be either plus infinity, minus infinity, or 0. It's either you know your value perfectly, you don't know your value at all, or um, that, that, that it's either plus 1, minus 1, or 0. And the messages essentially can only be plus 1, minus 1, 0, or erasure not erasure. So um, in the tutorial, we will do the definition or the derivation. And essentially, the iterative message passing decoder then works as follows. So we initialize all the variable nodes with the received value yi, same as before. We don't calculate log likelihood ratios. We can calculate log likelihood ratios and apply the sum product decoder. Works perfectly. But you will always handle plus infinity, minus infinity, and it will not be really elegant. So we can simplify this a lot. Okay. So we have we initialize everything with the received value. Then we broadcast the value of the variable nodes to all the connected check nodes. And then we process the check nodes. So we're looking at each edge of the check node. If all the other edges are not erased, then we know the values, then we can calculate the missing value, the missing bit in order that, that the parity check is fulfilled. So the outgoing message is the sum over all incoming messages. Recall these circles for the Hamming code in the initial example. If one value in a circle was erased, then we could calculate this one as the sum over all the other values. Exactly the same thing. So if all the incoming messages are not erased, we can calculate the outgoing message as the sum. If any one of the incoming messages is erased, the poor soldier in message passing cannot say anything, and he needs to declare an erasure in the outgoing message. And then we do the same for the variable nodes. And the variable nodes is just different. If all the incoming messages are erased, the outgoing message must be erased. Otherwise, if one of the messages is not erased, we have a repetition code. Recall the repetition code. If one message is not erased, we know all the other ones because it's just repeated. So if one is not erased, there is no error. We know the value and we can broadcast this value then. And then we just repeat this over and over again. That's the simplified decode on the binary erasure channel. Let's take a look at an example to illustrate this. So we have received the following word, zero, question mark, question mark, one, zero, question mark, zero. So we put our received values over here in the variable nodes. Now we initialize the variable nodes, and now we broadcast the values of the, of the variable nodes to the check nodes. We use the following legend. A dashed line means an erasure. A black line means zero. And the thick orange line means a one. So here we broadcast a zero to the check nodes. Here we broadcast an erasure to the check nodes, an erasure to the check nodes, a one to the check nodes, zero, erasure, and a one. Okay, next we need to process the check nodes. So the check node C1, um, check node C1 gets two erasures. So whenever you cover one of the incoming messages, you cannot say anything. You cover one of the incoming messages, you'll always have at least one erasure. You cannot say anything. So all the outgoing messages will be in erasure. Welcome to, this is too fast. Pause the video and try to do this for yourself. Same thing for check note C2. If any message is erased, uh, what is covered? All the other incoming messages are erasures. Now let's take a look at 
tech node C3. So if we cover this edge, then we see that the other messages are not erased. So they have zero, one, zero. So we can calculate the value of the outgoing message and it's going to be a one. So we see all the outgoing messages are going to be erasures, going to be erasures, erasures, and here the outgoing message is going to be a one. So we have recovered X3 hat because we know this value sends a message is equal to one. Now we broadcast the variable nodes again. So this variable node has been recovered. It's a one, so it can put a one along the other edge. It's not going to put a one along this edge because we cover the edge and we're looking at all the other edges. So all the other edges are erased, but now we cover this edge, then we get an unerased message and we can send this unerased message to this check node. So that's the difference here. And now let's take a look at the check node C1. So again, we only have one erased edge. We cover this edge. The incoming messages are not erased for the other edges. So we have zero plus one plus zero. So we're going to send a one along this edge. That's what we do over here. Send a one along this edge. And for C3, it's the same as previously. And that means we have recovered X2 hat. Now we do another um, yeah, update of the variable nodes. Now variable node um, X2 sends a one along this message or along this edge. And now we can recover check node C2. So if we cover this edge, we know that the incoming messages are 0, 1, and 1. So the outgoing message must be 0. And we have an outgoing message 0. And we have recovered the final and third erasure. So we have x6 to be equal to 0. And we have recovered all the code rounds. So after three rounds of decoding, we have recovered. And we can actually verify that this is a valid code word because h times x hat is equal to zero. And I'm also going to upload a simulation of this LPC code over the binary erasure channel MATLAB code onto our GitHub directory. So there is a very easy analogy um, to LPC decoding, and that's a Sudoku. A Sudoku is nothing else as a code word. So we have this solved Sudoku, that's a code word. It fulfills certain constraints. It fulfills the constraint that the number of digits in each row, in each column, and in each square must be distinct. And um, there are only a few possibilities, and all of these possibilities are essentially code words. And now we erase some positions in these code words, and these are then essentially um, uh, erasure channel. So we have an erasure channel and our people that like to solve the Sudokus, they get the erased messages and they need to solve the Sudoku. So uh, we can make an analogy or a simplified Sudoku, two by two Sudoku. So we have um, two by two squares, the numbers of one to four. And here we have one Sudoku and we can solve this. So this must be four and three um, to solve. And here we have, uh, this must be one and two. So then we have here one, we have uh, three over here. And then we can, we can continue um, solving this. So you can um, go ahead and uh, see if you can solve the remaining, um, edge, um, the remaining fields. So the empty fields, they denote erasures. And essentially every check node corresponds to a constraint. Constraint that all the incoming edges must have distinct values. So we can also define variable nodes and we can define constraint nodes. And we can um, have a tenor graph. So we have 16 variable nodes in our Sudoku and uh, we have the constraint that variable node v1, v2, v3, and v4 they must have distinct values. It's a different constraint, not as in LDPC codes, there the constraint is at the sum 
the number of ones must be even or the sum is constant. And here the constraint is that the numbers are all different. And uh, we have the row constraints, we have the column constraints, and we have the block constraints. So that in a square of two by two, the numbers are different. And this is an analogy. So you get some erasures and you need to do message passing in order to recover the erasures. And you can solve the Sudokus by doing message passing. And you will see the limitations because there are some Sudokus like the previous one, this one, that you can solve by just looking at it, but you cannot solve it easily using um, message passing. That doesn't work using message passing. Um, here you can solve this one easily. Here you have one and three, so this should be three and one. So then you have uh, two and four um, like this and the remaining four and uh, three. So solve it easily, but using message passing, it will not work because you'll have too many erasures in the different nodes. So you cannot solve it locally, but you need to take on a more global perspective. So this is why you try to solve this simple Sudoku that I just solved using message passing, it will not work. You will actually have the limitations that just by looking at the different constraints, you will not be able to solve it, but by looking at it holistically, you will be able to solve it. So this uh, message passing decoder is suboptimal and suboptimal means if the tenor graph of the LDPC code does not contain cycles, then it is essentially optimal. So if there are no cycles, then we, are, we have a code that is equivalent to the map decoder. But as soon as the code contains cycles, then the map decoder, map decoding cannot be achieved anymore. So because this is because when we derive the message passing decoder, we assume statistical independence of the messages. And if there are cycles, we cannot guarantee this statistical independence anymore. We saw this and soldier counting that just doesn't work anymore if there are cycles. So we have presented message passing. And message passing is a suboptimal decoder because we have practical codes that have cycles, but it has a very, very good performance. So it has an outstanding performance actually, and it has a low complexity. Now, of course, the question remains, if the algorithm is suboptimal for codes that have cycles in the graph, can we construct a good code that has no cycles? Then it would be perfect. We construct a code where the graph has no cycles, and suddenly we have an optimum algorithm. So let's go ahead and let's construct a code that has no cycles. Well, we can do this, but unfortunately will not be possible or the code that we construct will actually not be a very good code. So we have the following theorem. The following theorem says that we have a binary linear code of length n and the design rate rd. Um, and this code is constructed such that the tenor graph of the code has no cycles. Then unfortunately we have code that has a minimum distance of two and there are also quite a few code words of weight two, or the fraction of codes of weight two scales with the length n. Um, so that's a little bit unfortunate. And um, what we're going to do next is we're going to prove this theorem. So how can we prove this? Well, let's take a look at the tenor graph of a code that has no cycles. So um, we construct the tenor graph starting from the very first variable node. Then we have a bunch of check nodes. So assume we have this and we have no cycles. So we cannot go back to the variable nodes that have already been used. So this check node, for instance, needs to go to this variable nodes. This check node needs to go to this variable nodes and so on. So this variable node can connect to this check node. This variable node can connect to this check node. And I believe now we have constructed a cycle. Yes, now we have constructed a cycle. 
So this is actually no, this is not a cycle. So So this is actually the cycle. So the last connection doesn't work and we would need to go to a new variable node. So we only allow connections that don't lead to a cycle. And what we can actually see is that this graph that we have constructed is actually a tree. So we start with this red variable node then we have two children, which are check nodes. These are this check node one and two, one and two. Check node one has again two children. These are verb nodes V1, verb node V2, verb node V3, V3. B4, B5, B6, and this is check node 1, 2, and 3. So check node C2 is connected to B4 and B5. And uh, V2 then is connected to a check node C3. And C3 itself is connected to B6. So it actually becomes a tree. So a tenor graph without cycles can be visualized as a tree where always you have a layer of variable nodes, then you have a layer of check nodes, then you have a layer of variable nodes, then you have a layer of check nodes, and so on. So there's an equivalency between this tenor graph on the left-hand side and this tree on the right-hand side, which is equivalent to the variable node. So and based on this tree representation, we can now count the number of coders of lengths two. We can now start a counting exercise. So that's how we can prove the theorem. And we're actually going to prove the theorem only for a specific case. We're going to prove the theorem for a case of rate larger than one half, because that leads to very simple proof. If the rate is smaller than one half, the proof is much more. So we start by a few observations. First, we have n variable nodes and 1 minus the rate times n equals m check nodes. So the number of vertices in the graph is the number of variable nodes plus the number of check nodes. So we have n plus 1 minus rd times n. This is 2 minus rd times n. That's the number of vertices in the graph. And then I said we have a tree. Let's take a look at this example tree. So in this tree, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven vertices, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six edges. So the number of edges in a tree is always the number of vertices minus one. That's a fundamental rule of a tree. So we have two times rd minus n minus one edges, and we are going to upper bound the number of edges by two minus rd times n, so we're going just to neglect this minus one term because it's a nasty term. So we have the number of edges in the graph. So now we know that we have a bipartite graph. So each edge connects to exactly one variable node, and because we have the number of edges is upper bounded by 2 minus rd times n. So the degree of the variable node is upper bounded by 2 minus rd. So if the number of edges is smaller than 2 minus rd times n. And we have n variable nodes. So each edge connects to one variable node only. We have n variable nodes, so we can divide by n, and this will be the average number of edges per variable node, which is the degree. So we have a degree of the variable nodes that is upper bounded by 2 minus rd. 
Now, if we look at this tree, we can look as follows. So we have two types of variable nodes. We have internal variable nodes. Internal variable nodes. These are the ones that are inside the graph. And we have leaf nodes. As in a tree, we have the leaves, and the leaves are the ones that only have one connection. So the internal variable nodes, they have degree of at least two because they are connected to the layer above and to the layer below. So at least a degree of two because the degree is two minus RD. It means that we have at least n times RD um, variable nodes that are leaf nodes because otherwise the degree cannot be um, the degree should be larger than two. The degree is smaller than this expression because the internal variable nodes they have degree at least two. We have too many internal variable nodes, this number would go up. But it means we need to have at least RD times N leaf nodes because otherwise we cannot push the degree that far down. So we have at least N times RD leaf nodes. Now, what happens with such a leaf node? So such a leaf node is connected to exactly one check node. Exactly one check node. So what is the total number of check nodes? The total number of check nodes is one minus RD times N. So we have n times rd variable nodes minus the number of check nodes. Now it's pigeonhole principles. So we have 1 minus rd times n check nodes, and we have n rd variable nodes that are connected to only one check node. So if n times rd is larger than 1 minus rd times n, which because we have a rate larger than one half is the case, we have a certain number of leaf nodes that are connected to the same check node, to a check node that is adjacent to multiple leaf nodes. So and that's the number of uh, the number of leaf nodes minus the number of total check nodes. That's the number of variable nodes that are at least present that are connected to multiple leaf variable nodes. So these are let's say the red ones. So we have leaf variable nodes that are connected to check nodes that are adjacent to multiple leaf variable nodes. Those ones. This is a, a variable node that's connected to a check node that's connected not just to one leaf variable node, two leaf variable nodes. This check node is connected to just one leaf variable node. This guy is connected to two leaf variable nodes. So now if we take these two variable nodes, we set them to one. So this one, we set here one, we set a one, and all the other variable nodes are set to zero. We have a code word. Why do we have a code word? Because all the checks are fulfilled. So here we have a zero, plus one plus one is equal to zero. So this parity check is fulfilled. This parity check is fulfilled because all the adjacent variable nodes are equal to zero. This check node is fulfilled because all the adjacent variable nodes are equal to zero. So if we have such a variable node or such a check node with at least two such variable nodes, we can form a very simple code. Word. So we can pair such a variable node with another such leaf variable node, and we can give rise to a code word of weight two. And actually, we have many of those. So we have two times rd minus n times n such variable nodes that we can pair up 
and such that we get multiple such code words of weight two. So what we can take away from this is the following. All relevant codes have cycles because we don't want the minimum distance of two. We want the minimum distance to be at least a little bit larger so that we can correct at least some error patterns. We have a minimum distance of two and we have a lot of code words of weight two. We cannot distinguish those code words if there are some errors. So this is not something we want. So essentially what we can say is that all practically relevant codes have cycles and message passing using the sum product algorithm will always be suboptimal compared to the bitwise map decoder. That's the main takeaway from here. With this, we have finished this chapter on the introduction of LDPC codes. In the following slides, you will find some supplementary material like the rank Proofs for the rank of binary matrix, proof of weight enumerators, performance of MAC decoding, and the formal definition, at least the first half of it, of the sum product decoding algorithm. This is beyond the material of the lecture. And with this, I like to close this chapter and I welcome you in the next chapter.